Hello and welcome back to the Only Aki's podcast. On today's episode, joining Brandon and myself is an Aki's fan's favourite with over 120 appearances for the club. It's David Elibert. David, thank you very much for joining us, mate. No problem, guys. Glad to be up. Uh, I suppose let's just start right at the beginning. Um, did you grow up in a footballing family? Is that kind of um, is that kind of how your career started with your family being involved in it as well? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, my my father, my grandfather, and my my, my uncle all had um, decent football careers. My grandfather would have been more of a football coach. Uh, my father was a junior international um, in Ireland here, so he played for a junior team and represented Ireland at that level. And uh, my uncle. Um, he had a couple of trials with Arsenal and Coventry and other teams like that. So he kind of, he never got made the, the move abroad at 16 when I did, or like I did. Um, but yeah, like a bit of a bit of a prestigious football and family. So how did that move then? You talked about um, leaving obviously at 16. So how did that move to Preston come around then? Was it scouts over in Ireland uh, looking at the teams you were playing for then? Or how did that come around? Yeah, pretty much. So the way it works in Ireland is that um, there's a schoolboy league here. And um, yeah, basically just just like you said, try our scouts go out and watch the games and and handpick the best players to go across and trial to specific clubs. Um, so a few of the clubs I was over with again was the likes of Arsenal, Leicester, Aston Villa. Um, so usually what happens is every midterm you're gone, you're gone, gone over to England to, on trial for a week or whatever, a week or two. Um, so yeah, so just go over um, on trial, structure stuff, and um, see if you can get yourself a contract. How was that um, sort of decision to actually go over when Preston have offered, obviously offered you sort of a deal? Was it was it hard to make or was it just one you couldn't sort of refuse even at such a young age? No, I think it was always something that I wanted to do anyway. Um, even from a young age, like it was always my goal. Like every kid's young, young or every young kid's dream is to be a footballer. But luckily enough, I was I was half decent and, and got the opportunity to to first of all try with clubs and then luckily enough to, to get a, get offered a contract and sign and, and eventually go over. Um, in terms of the, the decision, I had, a, I had a couple of offers on the table. Uh, I just chose Preston because it was um, I was quite realistic in, in my, my my abilities and my, and my um, how would you say my, my attributes. So wouldn't have been the most quick quickest in the centre halves. And um, so I kind of took a step down. All a lot of the, the guys who I played international football with underage, they would have gone to Premiership clubs and signed big money deals. And, and for Preston, when they signed me, it was a big money deal for them because they never really offered. Um, a pro contract to a 16 year old before coming over from from Ireland so um, weighing everything up Preston showed um, uh, a lot of I would you say they, 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 they proved to me that they wanted me um, somebody somebody said to me a long time ago I'll always go where you wanted so um, Preston showed their showed their kind of their, their cards early doors and um, yeah it was it was an easy decision in the end they're like at the time David Moyes was the manager top of the championship in the playoffs, so it was a it was a club on the up anyway, and um, so I seen it as a stepping stone for maybe maybe bigger things, you know. And <clears throat> obviously, then the Aki's move came around after after the pressing the pressing ended. How did the Aki's interest come about? Because obviously, the move north of the border is maybe not one expected, um, given obviously with the pressing and, and on loan down in England as well. So, how did Aki's? How did you know Aki's were interested, and how did that interest come around? Um, I think at the time there was a strong Scottish link with, with Preston anyway. Um, with David Moyes being there already, there was already that, that Scottish link anyway. Um, Craig Brown took over from David Moyes and Billy Davis was uh, Craig Brown's number two. Um, so yeah, so it was actually when Billy Davis took over from Craig Brown as manager that I, I'd been training with the first team. Um, so, so that was the first first year that I had been officially training with the, pre, with the, with the first team. So I'd done pre-season with the first team and then was loaned out then to Scarborough for a couple of months. Um, so it was only when I came back from Scarborough then that um, Aki's were looking for a centre-half. I'd been in touch with Billy Davis. And um, I wasn't I wasn't eligible to play in the reserve games again until after Christmas, um, just to do with some, something to do with the registrations or something like that. I was still registered up until Christmas or whatever, at the way for the transfer window. So Aki's were looking for a centre-half. They had looked at the, another 19s lad that was there already. So I was a year above him. And, and Billy just said, look at... Um, it was sorry, Billy Davis and, and Billy Reid were having, com- having conversations, and he said, "Look, there's a lad coming back on loan from Scarborough, and um, he's better than what's on offer there. Um, so have a look at him." So, <laughs> thank, thank you, Flay. Did um, yeah. did you have a chance to discuss with the board and the management before going up to Akis about what they expected of you, being obviously a young player yourself? Um, no, it, it, probably at the time, Akis were um, a mid-table first division team, 
Um, however, they, they were building, they were definitely building. And it was only when I went up and you could see the characters in the, in the dressing room and stuff like that, um, that you knew there was something something, something positive and it was going to happen to the, to the club at the time, you know. And obviously, being a, young, <clears throat> pardon me, sorry, being a young player yourself was the assurances that you knew Aki's were bleeding in other young players at the same time as you coming up. Was that a, a positive, a motivation for you to go up as well and join that group of players? Yeah, so so I wouldn't have known too much about Aki's before I went up. Um, mm-hmm. Being a first division Scottish team, like uh, realistically, I'd only really be looking at the likes of Celtic and Rangers and see how how they're doing in, in the top flight, you know. Um, so when I went up, it was it was it was good just to get a get a get a get a feel for the club and and then at the time there was the likes of James McCarthy was training with the with the first team obviously and, and trying to make it or kind of making his breakthrough at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I got I definitely know it was something and there was a lot of young young talent at at the club. And training with the first team, so I noticed early that there was there was definitely a um a, a focus of, of the club was to push for for young lads coming through. On the so, yeah. so. on the flip side of that, um, obviously we mentioned the young guys. Do you think having players like Mark McLaughlin, sort of Marvin Wilson, Alex Neil, did that make it a bit of an easier transition as well? Because you had sort of those experienced heads within the dressing room, sort of making it easier for the young players come through. Yeah, um, I think what the what the lads were great for when I went up there first was was driving standards. And um, you can see there was a, it was a good culture in the team at that time. So like I said, the names you mentioned there, like all really strong characters, really good players, um, driving all the young lads and most young lads were doing all that running for them. My debut for Aki's was against Clyde. You might have been st- you might not have been out in Aki's yet then. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now oh, the, the the definitely the first the, the first full season for Aki's was the first game was was Gretna there. Um, yeah, baptism of fire. I remember Billy read the Royal Act. It was a half time, me in particular, and um, yeah, so we, we ended up going back to the to the pre season routine uh, for about two or three weeks after that, and doing laps around the track and stuff like that, trying to get fitter. And and luckily, um, we, we finished the season stronger than we, than we started, obviously, you know. Yeah, and in that was his first season, you said you finished fourth. Um, great achievement, obviously, for the team as well to kind of build up um, ready for that next season. But for you personally, how was that as a first as a first full season in Scottish football? Yeah, uh, look, it was it was my first full full season in senior football, really. So it was it was a good grounding experience for me. Um, like I mentioned before, there was there was good senior pros at the club at that time, so it, it was they were they were guiding us all the way along. Uh, it was, I felt it was a good mix between youth and experience. So, so the fourth season, my, my fourth season in senior football, James McArthur probably his fourth season in senior football as well. So it was great experience for us, us guys to go out there and play week in, week out um, in the fourth division. And I think it just it, it, um, it left us in, in, a, in a good position for the following season when we gained promotion. And, you know. So obviously in that season when we finished fourth, um, what was the sort of message from like the rest of the squad and the sort of management going on in the next season, what was the sort of, was the goal to get promoted? Was that what you were looking for? Did you think you were capable of it? Or what was the sort of um, outcome you were looking for that season? Yeah, I think I think back then, I don't think there was any real um, sit-down conversations where, where as, as a group where we're going, no, listen, as we're going to win the league this year. Um, I just think that um, we built on this, the squad that we built in, in that season was stronger than the, the group from the, the previous year. And in pre-season, when you can see the bodies in, it was like, yeah, okay, we've, we've actually got a chance here. Like, we're gonna we're gonna push any team, you know. Um, a lot of it was down to the to the good start he made. I think we went the first seven games, we won all seven. Um, so that was that was that was huge, and that really kind of that set the tone then, not only for us in the, in the dressing room, but to the rest of the other teams in the league as well. So it kind of it put our put our stamp down and and, and uh, just let people sit up and take notice of us and know that we were there, we were there to to compete. I think on the, the first seven games, if I remember correctly, um, the first game of the season, I'm sure it was Dunfermline at home. And I think Dunfermline just been, were just relegated. So yeah, that's right, yeah. um, I think everybody came into the game because I remember I was actually sat, sat next to Lee Naylor and Kenny Miller, um, yeah. who were obviously Premier League players at the time. And I think everybody was expecting Dunfermline to come and just um, sort of wipe the park with Aki's that game. And yeah, we, we won it 2 0. And that sort of stated the case for the rest of the season, probably. Yeah, 2-0 or 2-1? I'm saying 2-0, but it might have been 2-1. I, I think it was 2-1. I think it was 2-1. I think we went 2-0 up and they, they scored late. Like, mm-hmm. made a bit nervous. But no, I remember that, that game in particular. So yeah, there was a, there was a buzz about Dunfermline coming. And I think that was mm-hmm. that was more beneficial for us coming to our place in the first game of the season. Um, so we were we were dealing with the, the team that was in the SPL. A lot of, 
a lot of good players like like Stephen Glass, um, Borussia was up front, uh, Tom McManus up front. So all these all these guys have been like regulars in in the SPL for years, you know. And um, so it gave us the incentive to go and go and like make our mark in this league and, and prove that we can we can compete at a, at a higher level. Um, with with Dunfermline, I think it was uh, it was it was um. They kind of the mood in, in our camp afterwards it was, it was like as if they they thought they were going to walk the floor with us when when they came, when they came to our place you know, um Aki's obviously finishing fourth year before they didn't they they really didn't know anything about us, um and we kind of caught them on the bounce um but yeah no, it was a good result great start to the season uh, a game where I actually started really full in and I was marking Stephen Glass I was I was uh, I had a man marking job with him so I think I just followed him all around the park. <laughs> People will always talk about in that season um. The goals that were scored for Aki's, but that defensive partnership with yourself, Marco uh, Swales as well. I think it was only three goals conceded at home or something in the league when we were looking it up. Um, two. two. Well, there you go. I mean, that, that's a, that's we never forget that. We never forget that. That's 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 an unbelievable achievement. Do you know what I mean? How how did you guys manage to be such a good unit together? Um, you know, um, again, again, I think it was down to the, the experience. Like Big Marco had been around the block. Um, so myself as as coming in, that, that would have been my second season. So, um, obviously had aspirations to play at a higher level. So you're kind of you're striving every day to make yourself better. And um, I think we saw in Tom Parrott as well, who played right back that season for us. And uh, I believe Easty was left back, I think, yeah. that, in that league winning season. Um, so yeah, so like, there's a back four that, that could have played in any team in the, in the fourth division that year. Uh, any any top team in that league, and I just think it was down to good communication. Now in front of us, we had Alex Alex Neal and, and James McCarthy for most of the season. Uh, Alex just used to used to sit in front and screen the striker, so it, so it, uh, straight away that just cuts the supply off for for the opposition. You know, um, made our job an awful lot easier. And uh, another thing to do with that is I would have been very vocal and a good communicator on the pitch. So it's all about and, and Marco would have been as well. So it's all about those relationships between your back four and your midfield and front. Um, stop and supply from the source basically and um, and then up front and in, in the rest of the midfield we had we good wingers in the likes of Gills and and, uh, and strikers with Richie Offion banging the goals in for us up front so so all, all around it was it was a strong squad and then we also had Stuart Taylor who's the gaffer now um, he I think he scored four in the first seven and got a bad bad ankle injury after that and he, that, that forced him to retire but but with those kind of those players that, again there's a good mix of experience and young young players there who are Trying to prove themselves. So, so Richard Offion would have came from Newcastle or came from the, the lower leagues in England. I would have came from Preston. A bit of a point to prove and let go from them teams. So it was always that. And I think that was one of the one of the, the um, factors for Aki's are, are certainly for the for the chairman and, and the manager. They were always looking for the, these little kind of gold nuggets of players that have been, maybe been released. Certainly young lads who, who had who had a point to prove. And if you mix them with, with good experience and and a good talent like the likes of Alex Neal and uh, Marvin Wilson. As you mentioned, Mark McLaughlin, Chris Wales. Um, I, I remember Stevie Thompson was there for my four seasons, so he was brilliant as well. Um, for my for my development, um, Graham Jones was there as a striker coming towards the end of his career. Um, so yeah, so like mixing all this, all, all the young hungry players with with, with, the, with the, this experienced group of, of um, senior pros, um, just just grew a team really, uh, and there was a good connection there. Uh, there was no dicks in the dressing room, um, so. Now we we, fairly, we bonded fairly quickly as a team, and and that core group of players just kind of stayed together for for the whole group until they're until we kind of we got relegated that season in, in the SPL, or the lads are so long like in the, in the likes of James McCarthy and James McCarthy and Easy. So we've obviously previously touched on that Dunfermline game, um, the first game of the season. Is there any other games within that sort of um, league winning season that stand out for you? I know there is quite a few that stand out for me, but is there any personally for you that stood out? Yeah, there'd be a few, all right. There, there would have been like, sort of Dunfermline away, where we battered them basically. We went in at half time, I think it was four nil up, or three nil up anyway. Um, we really like done them over in that first half. I think we were, we were three nil up going in at half time, and I remember Dunfermline fans clapping us off at half time, and that was that was kind of very humbling and and uh, kind of going Jesus. <laughs> it's not very often you see that, but it, but it, such as the display from ourselves, we were so dominant in that first half. And then I think in the second half we came out and the ball came back to me and I played a long ball and we scored straight away. So that kind of put the game to bed then. And um, yeah, so that, that would have been one of the ones that I remember. It was also one away at Clyde where we went 2-0 down very early and turned around and we won 3-2. Um, that was also an, a, one of those games where um, 
it's we didn't play particularly well in that game, but we ground out the result. And then when we got the, the first goal back after half time, the momentum is with you then. Um, so of a good team is to win when they're when they're not playing particularly well. And I think that's what we done that game. And, and, and again, like from, from 2 0 down, I think you had everybody else in the league looking at the results and going, Yeah, Aki's are gonna lose, they're gonna drop points here, and then to turn it around, it just kinda it burst burst other other teams' balloons and, and kicked those on again, you know, with, with those sort of results. I think one that I always remember as well, it wasn't the league, but it was when we beat Kilmarnock 2 0 at home. I think that was quite a big shock to Scottish football. I was a ball boy that game. Mm-hmm. And I was getting spat on, getting scarves chucked to me from the command. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, I think command came there just like in Finland. I didn't th- thought it was going to be a sort of walk in the park, and it was a sort of reality check for the sort of them and the sort of whole Scottish football that we actually might get promoted that year. Yeah, I think that game was it was a great occasion for the club. You know, it was, um, it was obviously taking a step away from the league and taking a. Um, Playing, playing that cup match, cup, cup match just kind of deflects a little bit from the league. Um, but like I said, or like you said, when because it's an SPL opposition, it highlights the game even further. I can guarantee you, Kilmarnock didn't know, like uh, probably ha- a handful of our players, maybe the senior lads, who maybe they played against before. But Kilmarnock were an established SPL club at that stage. So um, again, like them, family, they would have came to our place, not expecting too much. And um, yeah, we put them to the sword too. Now. So great result for that was one of the first seasons on a personal note for me that I can really recall Aki setting the bar for what was expected of Aki's team in terms of the energy and the tenacity, but also being able to play good football. Were you guys aware of the, the changes within the team um, that season, especially with how the team played, how the team set up and the standards that were getting set um, kind of going forward for the seasons ahead? Um, I, th- I think we were always aware of the, the conveyor belt, the young lads coming through each year, you know, and, the, and even some of the young lads training with us. Uh, from time to time, and some of these lads are 15, 16, like, like James McCarthy, for example, prime example of that. We also had other lads like the likes of Andy, Andy Ryan, who's back there now at the club. So there was a, there was always a there was always a link between the the academy section and the club, and I guess that's um, part of the, the club's strategic plan is to, is to promote young lads and and um, have a specific style of playing. Now it wouldn't mean something that we would have been focusing on on, on a sports team was because we were in our own little bubble and. And just focusing on, on training and playing and, and getting the best of ourselves, you know. Um, it's only now really when I look back on it and and think of like I'm now doing my coaching by just doing I've done a sport management degree now at this stage, so it's it's I'm seeing the bigger picture of Aki's now and, and they're, they're they're certainly back then and now. Um, it's certainly a strategic plan of theirs to promote the young lads because let's be honest, uh, Aki's haven't got a fantastic fan base, but and money doesn't grow in trees, so it's if you can save the club a few bob and. I'm promoting young lads and getting young lads into the first team all, all, all well and good, you know. Going into that that game just before Clyde where, they, where we, we sealed the win, we sealed the promotion, what was the feeling like going into that game knowing that, you know, this could be it? Was there nerves or was it just a case of it's another game? You know, we're not, we're um, not the team we're, we're just going I into think, it. I think there was games previous to it that were that would have been wobble games, if you like. So in the, in the lead-up, we had, um, I think it was Livy away, um, we had St. Johnston at home and I think those two games so so going back to your statistics of the, of the two goals you conceded we'd only conceded those two goals to Livy and I think both games were one all at home and so they were the only team to score against us at home that, that season um, so with that in mind we knew Livy was a, was a decent club they had some top players like Snoddy and, and Graham Dorans up front so, that, so they were a decent very decent team um, so it was going to be hard to go there and get a result um, so we went there. I think we ended up beating three one or three two at their place. Um, but for me in that game, actually, I remember that that game as being one of my one of my worst of the season. I remember thinking, feeling the nerves of that that year, you know, or that in, in that game in particular. Um, but luckily enough, uh, the lads carried me through that game, and, and it was always a case of where if you have seven, eight, nine lads playing well, you'll you'll more than likely get across the line with that with that squad of players. Um, games after that, like the St. Johnson games, St. Johnson are always they were a tough, tough side, a really physical team. Like say Kenny Duker, um, Martin Hardy in the middle of the park, Simon Manson was playing for them at the time, so really, really experienced team. Um, Jason Scotland, I think, was up front as well, so we knew we were up against it that game, and, and it didn't matter if we were playing them home or away. So that St. Johnson team were hard to beat, and that was that was basically it. We ended up beating them two 0 at our place, and he got scored in that game as well. Um, so they were they were the potential banana skin games, and then it was once you get past them, and we got past them, beating the two of them. 
Um, not that it was plain sailing, but we kind of not done done the hard part as such. But the last two games were Clyde and actually done the away. But we'd already finished it at the, at the Clyde game, so it didn't really make a difference after that, you know. And did you get a <laughs> chance on your goal banner? I was I was going to say, um, obviously Dundee was um, the game where it was them that were ultimately up against to sort of get promotion. So we already sealed it at Clyde. Um, did the celebration start at Clyde, or did you wait until after Dundee? Because if I remember rightly, I'm sure the players all went up to the vaults after the Clyde oh, game. Mate, absolutely, we celebrated our hearts. <laughs> I think it was four days on the drink <laughs> <laughs> after that. So uh, actually, come the Dundee game. Um, I think I was the only one who started the game that, st- that started the game against Clyde. He rested it, everybody else except for me. I must have been showing it on the training pitch or something. <laughs> I was to try to run the drink out when you were playing in the Saturday. Um, so, yeah, so he, he mixed the team up completely. I think James McCarthy made his debut in, in that game away to Dundee. Another couple of young lads, Andy Waterworth, was part of that group. Um, so, yeah, so he gave, he gave a couple of a couple of debuts since their, their debut. It'd be Grant Gillespie played in that game as well, did he? He was yeah, definitely coming into this team, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think Gills might have played in that game. Um, so yeah, so like I gave give give everybody else a, a, a little bit of a chance to play a, a big game like that, especially Dundee. And um, we ended up going up there and drawing one all. And, and the thing that I remember most with that game was Dundee gave us a guard of honour and the looks we were getting from <laughs> the pitch. And some of the lads like hadn't played like only played a handful of games. James McCarthy making his debut and he's getting a, a guard of honour onto the pitch. The lads weren't too best pleased. <laughs> And that was the first, the club's first promotion to the top flight in like twenty years or something. Was that milestone prevalent within the team? But like, were you aware of the effect that would have on on the fans, given it was so long since the last promotion to the top flight? Um, I th- again, I think we were in our own little bubble. Um, obviously aware of the fans and the history of the club, but we were just focused on on what we we need, we wanted to achieve and, and where the where we seen seen ourselves. Um. It was only really afterwards where you'd end up around in the vaults and, 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 and pubs like that and the, the local community where where you, you, you realise the effect that, that it has on fans, you know. Um, obviously, going a bit more into depth in, in my sport management degree is fans is everything for sport, you know. Um, so, yeah, so look, at we weren't really wholly aware, but certainly after that game, we beat Clyde and we won the league and, and just the emotional reaction from, from all the fans, it was, uh, it was incredible, really, so. Um, and then, and then after that, you kind of you, you know how big of big of a place in the community the club has. You know, you mentioned being in the local community. Um, did David Graham ever take you to the palace? Yeah, I was in the palace a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't once or twice. Uh, once with David Graham, I think. And uh, no, another time with a couple of friends over, and we were around having a few drinks um, locally, and we just ended up in the palace. Just wanted to wanted to kick on and, and make a night of it. So. <laughs> Wasn't too many times in the palace, but look at Glasgow was only 15, 20 minutes away. So, and that was that was that was a better buzz and a better vibe in Glasgow. Anyway, so we found ourselves in there more often than not. <laughs> <clears throat> so, in that first flight back, uh, in that first season, sorry, back in the top flight, how did you find that differed from the championship? Given you were coming up in obviously against tougher opposition, better players, did you find that the mentality maybe had to change at Aki's? Um, going from being you know one of the best or the best team in the league before to maybe being one of the underdogs in the in the top flight. Um, yes and no. I mean, at the start of the season before we won it, we would have been considered underdogs. So mm-hmm. we always had that label of underdogs anyway. So I think that's that it was a label that suited us as a squad because if, if teams underestimated us, we can we can we have a point to prove then. And I think that was um, an un- underlying characteristic of the of the group when the chips were down. We really kind of. Um, like got together and battled, battled through it, battled through any any issues or any uh, any problems, you know. Um, but yeah, like like I mean, it, it was definitely it was it was a definite step up in standard and everything like that. It was more consistent, more consistency needed at that top level. Um, so yeah, it was it was a learning curve for me in, in particular. Um, again, I was still only I was only twenty two going up into the into that into the SPL, so I had a lot to learn, a lot to prove, and um, it was probably really only in my towards the end of the season, second half of the season, and then into the um, the second season where I really kind of got to grips with with the standard and the level and and my own consistency and um, yeah so so it was a learning curve for me and the team. You've obviously mentioned that we've been underdogs and sort of um, people maybe writing you off and stating that from the start like you did against Dunfermline. Do you think that Dundee United game where I think it was a Monday night first game of the season? Do you think going into that game, winning that game, that really um, set the tone of 
we're not here just to get sort of um, pushed about. We're actually here to give it a good go. If yeah, know. again, like like teams coming to coming to our place or coming to New Douglas Park, if they underestimate us, they were in for a, in for a shock, a rude awakening, because we weren't the team that was going to roll over. I remember somebody somebody from St. Mary um, saying to us or somebody like reporting back to us that if Aki's if Aki scored against you, you're in trouble because it's hard to score against you. So that that for us was a it was um it was a very it was a huge compliment certainly to himself as a defender and um, but to to ourselves as a as a group and as a team um again going back to the statistic that we, we we try not to concede too many goals or we don't concede too many goals um so yeah so like that again I think we got it we got a good start that season so we had Dundee United at home there's always going to be a, a rise in level straight away with the buzz and, and everything else so I think we, we beat Dundee United at home um. I can't remember who played in the, in the second game, but we went up to Aberdeen, I think, in the third game and beat them 2-1 away. So that's they're, they're huge results for a club like Ackies. Like. Um, yeah, and those, those who want to disrespect us and call us little Ackies or whatever they want to call us, they were in for a, in for a shock. And we went there just to, for a game of bingo, as you like. We were there to compete and, and, uh, and um, yeah, get as high up the table as you could and, and survive, you know. So what was the so what would you say the sort of mentality of both yourself and the squad was in that transition? Did... Was it just to sort of, um, or we want to stay up, or did you have like, in your own bubble that you had just sort of own ideas of what you wanted to do that season? Um, yeah, I think as a group it was a survival first, and then whatever comes after that, or however, however the league was going, or, or the whatever stage in the league it was going, or however we were performing, we kind of take it as it comes, you know. And um, but first and foremost, like, like he's, isn't it the biggest of club, and and have been renowned for kind of yo-yoing up and down over over the years. So like, to, for us to establish ourselves in the SPL, that was the most important thing. Um, and then like over the years, um, a couple of seasons in the SPL after that, we managed to finish higher up. Um, unfortunately, our, our little bubble burst after about three or four years. But um, no, we, we, we found a, a good balance probably in the second year. I think we finished seventh in that year and that was the highest we finished. So so yeah, it was a, it was a year-on-year progression for us. Um, but yes, fourth season definitely... Like surviving was was the main target initially. And how did you find playing in the Lanarkshire Derby? Famously quite quite tough and uh, scrappy games, I suppose is the best way to put it. How did you find playing in those? Yeah, again, just with the squad, I don't think we were ever afraid of those those games and those battles. So um, it suited some of us. It certainly suited myself. It would have suited Big Marco, um, James McCarthy would have suited him. Hard working Grafton midfielder. Um, Maybe the wingers it didn't see as much <laughs> like the wee gills and that he wouldn't he would he'd shake a tackle, but um, no for the rest of the squad like like we 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 weren't afraid of those kind of December December nights in the mucky pitch and down a fair park or up at our place and, and to roll up the sleeves and get stuck in so yeah a couple of heat battles along over the years but um one or some some thoroughly enjoyable ones from from my my account here on. On the note of certain matches, obviously we've talked about the Lancashire Derby. Is there any other matches from your time in the Championship, either specific matches or just against a specific team that sort of stood out for you? Um, obviously the main two playing at Ibrox and Celtic Park, but they're the, they're the obvious ones. But I used to I used to like playing at Pataudry. Um, again, another big club, big stadium, um, good fans. Um, I guess it's just that atmosphere. Whatever grounds can create that that atmosphere and that buzz of, of um, like the big time, if you like. Um, yeah, I think I think those games in, in particular were, were the were the highlights for me in the SPL, you know. And whilst you were at the club, you got the opportunity to represent Ireland in the under twenty ones. Um, I mean, what was that feeling like being being asked to re- to represent your country and obviously you captained them at one stage as well? Yeah, it was brilliant. I mean, I, I kind of from the nineteens, I sorry, I captain or represented my country all the way up from the fifteens up to up to nineteens at that stage, and then because it was still at Preston, you you kind of uh, you're, you're still in the limelight for the for the the lads are for the the FAI and their scouts going over to watch games in England because they don't usually make it over to, to Scotland. Um, but one thing um, that that was great for me was that James McCarthy McCarthy was making his breakthrough, and he was being highlighted as, a, as the next best thing, and, and he was um, he was representing Ireland. So that encouraged their, the scouts to come over. So I don't know if that had a had a had a positive effect on me making the, my twenty ones debut and um, going to that tournament in Malaysia after we won the league. And huge honour, first of all, to be um, selected, and then even greater honour to, to play and to captain the country at the 21 level. So, so I still have the, the jersey, the armband, and a couple of pictures floating in the house. 
It's brilliant. Do you ever feel like you are going to break, like you've obviously mentioned James McCarthy there, did you ever feel like yourself you could have broke into the full national side? Uh, honestly, no. Um, I think I'd, I'd be kidding myself on if I said, yeah, I've got a chance of getting through to the force team because even at the likes of, so Darren, Darren O'Day would have, been, would have been making his breakthrough at Celtic around the same time. Um, so you'd imagine Darren to be higher higher up the pecking order than me with, with the Irish Association uh, or the, the FAI. So, and then there was a lot of other centre-halves in particular that I would know who were playing championship level, like the likes of Paddy McCarthy, who was at uh, Crystal Palace for years. Um, these sort of guys who haven't really hadn't really featured in the in the, the, the Irish team or got anywhere near um, the first team or the the, for, the national team. Um, but saying that at the time, the Irish centre halves were pretty strong. Like you had the likes of Richard Dunn in there and, and um, um, other lads like that. So I was like, I mean, like traditionally, I think we we produce good centre halves and good defenders because we have to be <laughs> at the end of the day. We're not the not the greatest of teams, so we have to have to be good at, good at defending and keeping goals out. So. I think ahead of me in the pecking order, like at one stage, I think I counted about ten at least. I could think of off the top of my head. So I was, like I said earlier on, in the in the, in the podcast here, I was I was always realistic about my own um, attributes and um, expectations. And um, yeah, so I knew I knew it was a long shot, and, and uh, but there'd have to be a maybe a break a breakout of COVID or something like that for me to get a show. <laughs> Do you think that on that note, maybe? Results might have hampered your chances slightly because although individual performances would have been pretty solid, which was shown you've shown with the sort of stats with how many goals we conceded, etc. But being at Aki's, the results weren't weren't always going to show. So do you think that might have hampered your chances slightly because it was maybe you were performing at a certain level, but because if uh, maybe scouts, etc., they weren't at the games, but they see that we were getting beat sort of more often than not, that might have hampered your chances. Um, to be honest, mate, I think I was I was well off the radar anyway, so it didn't really make a difference. I think if scouts were at the games for the FAI, they'd be they'd be coming to watch James McCarthy and, and not me in particular. Um, they might see me and go, "Oh, Jesus, Dave, he's still playing here or whatever," you know. But um, I don't think I was high up on their on their, their scouting list anyway. So, like realistically, no, I didn't didn't ever see myself making a break tuning. And obviously, Billy Reid was your manager at Aki's for for a long time and played a massive part of your time there. Mm-hmm. How did you find him as a manager, and what did you feel was his like biggest strength as a manager? Was he um, did it, was he tact? Obviously, he was tactically brilliant. How was he with man management and you know, off the pitch as well? What did you find his biggest strength was? Yeah, I think I think uh, first of all, like Billy gave me a chance in first team football, really. So I I owe an awful lot to Billy, and um, yeah, his, his strengths were were man management really. So even at the, at the after the game. So the six 0 drubbing at Gretna, uh, wrote the right act to us and me in particular. I think we played Queens Park then in the cup on the Tuesday night, and I had another mayor, and he pulled me in afterwards and just gave me a sit down talk, and it was just like, okay, like is everything okay? And I says, yeah, I'm just playing you. So, <laughs> so I couldn't get my head around it, and why I was playing so bad at the start of the season. So that's why we are, we kind of went back to pre-season again over the next couple of weeks. Um, but that that particular moments so or those those um, difficult moments you call them in, in football, Billy was always great. He'd always very approachable, and his man management was was brilliant for that, you know. And he would get you out of the, the bad place you were in, and um, yeah, get us get us back to where we where we were as players and, and individuals and and, and uh, personalities, you know. So yeah, it's definitely man management was his strengths. Tactically, he was he was decent enough. Um, I think we could have been a bit more tactically better. Um, um, just in, in certain games you would have played against, you, you always question if you lost the game what, what went wrong and, and that sort of thing. So, but no, definitely, man management was was one of his huge strengths, and that has kind of stood to him now um, as an assistant manager now for the couple, last couple of seasons or probably the last decade since he left Aki's. Um, he's been assistant manager, and that's that's his character. Um, he's he's friendly, he's approachable, he, he loves to have a bit of a bit of a bit of a laugh and a bit of cracking a few jokes and all that sort of thing. And his sessions are good. Um, so that that route would nearly suit um, an assistant manager, a coach better, because the the head coach, the manager, has to be the the bad guy sometimes, you know. Since obviously Bellerin's moved on, he's obviously, as you mentioned, been assistant manager. He's been assistant manager at Swansea. There's a point when he, he was manager at Aki's where Swansea were linked with them, where you'd been at the club, and he rejected the opportunity mm-hmm. because he thought there was um, a unfinished business with Aki's. Um, what was it like when that sort of came about and where was the dressing room surprised and what do you think about him obviously rejecting that at the time? Yeah, I think that was a huge shock to the dressing room at the time that he stayed because 
Um, as players and individuals, I think if Swansea came in looking for any one of us, we'd have, we'd have jumped at it and, and been gone. Like we wouldn't even have to negotiate terms and conditions; we'd have just been gone. Like I mean, it was championship at the time. Um, I think um, was it when Roberto Martinez went to Swan or went to Everton? I think it was just before. It was before that or after. It was Fuesca. I think to went to Leicester. I think right, right. Um, um, so it was, it was along the, around that time, anyway. But. Um, yeah, a huge shock, and we were actually saying in the dressing room we should have gone. <laughs> so yeah, so that, that that'll tell you where, where how how shocked we were on as uh, with his decision, you know. But um, no, look at it, that. That's um, again, it's down to the, Billy's character. He felt as if that he could take the club a little bit further than, than he'd already done. Um, I don't know if, if the end of that season to be finished seventh. So that's the highest that he's have ever finished. So he wasn't wrong in that regard. Um, but yeah, after after that, I think we, we started to kind of to wilt away and, and our bubble start, start our burst a little bit and um things got a little bit difficult for us for us then and we we were relegated. So maybe like in hindsight it's probably a bad move, but who knows? If you went down to Swansea, you could have got sacked after a couple of months and and, and God knows, like like hindsight is a great thing, like I said. So but anything could happen in, in that move. Um so yeah, so but I, I don't think his career has panned out too too bad for him anyway. Another person that sort of did get an opportunity and actually did take it whilst at Aki's was someone that you'll know really well with Alex Neil. Um was it clear like, I think you've touched on it at the start, but was it clear that he was going to go into management in itself from, from your time since he was there? Yeah, I think so. I think Alex as a as a character in general, he's a he's a natural leader. Um good organizer, understands the game, good communicator on the pitch, um high standards, a really driven character. Um, so, yeah, so he had all, all the characteristics to make a good manager and it's not surprising that he's managed some of the big clubs and um, that he's managed and achieved what he's achieved and now he's um, Sunderland's new manager. So, the very best of luck to him. In that last season, obviously, when we got relegated, just before that, we'd lost McCarthy uh, and Easton to, to Wigan and Burnley. Um, I know they were young players, but they were important parts of that team. Did you feel that that had an, had an impact on the, the season when we got relegated? Um, or was there was there obviously more defining factors than, than just losing those two key players? Um, I think there was more defining factors. I think some of the signings that we made didn't really probably didn't integrate as well as they had done in, in previous years for the club. And um, there was still a spine of the, of the, the group of players that were there. Um, but looking at a bigger picture now, um, you're probably thinking that any of the bottom teams um, in the SPL, if, if they're to lose two of their best players, the wheels would fall off like, mm. like with any any team in that league. So I guess it wasn't, it was probably a, a bigger bigger factor and a bigger characteristic or a bigger um, reason why we ended up getting relegated. Because I mean, like if you look at James, the career James he's had and the career he's had, like both of them have played at minimum SPL level and championship and premiership now at this stage. So, to lose two players with, with, with that quality um, would hurt any team, not 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 just a team that are fighting for relegation, you know? Mm-hmm. Obviously, with um, you mentioned sort of players we brought in, it was sort of quite a big influx of um, players that season. Um, do you think that maybe disturbed the sort of harmony in which the, the dressing room had that sort of togetherness that he's had and that was maybe one of them most important reasons why we did stay up for this season because there was such a close bond and then we bring in such an influx of new players that maybe weren't used to everybody together and that's maybe what ultimately did relegate us. Um yeah it definitely had it it definitely was a was a, was another factor in, in the relegation and how how um we ended up being being relegated and, and the downturn from the club for probably from that, that season of finishing seventh um the I, I, to be honest with you, it was it was um, like losing the quality that we lost, like James McCarthy, James McCarthy, Brian Easton, um, Alex. I think was injured for a good a good season. Um, so again, and Marco was was injured a little bit as well. No, no I wasn't exactly one hundred percent fit the whole time myself either. So to have those um, distractions and 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 um, just like, things knocking you the whole time, for, like for a club who's trying to survive, basically, that's, that's really kind of it's really hard to deal with and really hard to manage. Um, and like I mean, we nearly we nearly stayed up that season, and um, it was close enough. And um, I think it came down to like the last couple of games of the season when St. Mary beat us away at their place. I kind of put the nail in our, in our coffin. Um, but yeah, no, I'd say some of the signings just just didn't integrate as best as uh, as best as they had done in previous years. You know, um, yeah, just one of the main, one of the main factors. It's it's hard. And it's another thing that I, that um, I would realize from my time here in the League of Ireland football is so 
League of Ireland footballers in general only get one-year contracts. So the disturbance for managers and, and squads that at the end of the season, you're nearly having to start again. So I think in the last season at Aki's, I think there was like something like 14 or 15 new signings that year for the squad. And that, that's a huge upset and a huge upheaval for any squad. And trying to integrate integrate that many players into a squad that was already kind of established is, is really difficult. Um, and with the with, with everything else that went on, a couple of lads leaving that added fuel to the fire, you know. At the end of that season, yourself and a group of other players left the club. Do you think that if we'd have stayed up, that maybe yourself and other players wouldn't have left, or was it just the right time to go? Was it the right time to, to move on and, and, and um, a new channel? No, I think from my own point of view, um. So looking at the whole squad as a picture, the budget was obviously slashed going down into the into the first division, right? So um, Marco was on a, a long contract. Uh, Martin Canning was on a longer contract. Simon Manson was on a, a longer contract. You can play centre half as well and had done in the SPL. So you're kind of looking at it from, from the club's perspective and, and um, yeah, it's probably, there was I was surplus requirements really at the end of the day. Like There was no point in me hanging around and having four really good centre halves in the first division when you probably really only need three and then a backup, maybe. Um, now, when I left, the likes of Mikey Devlin and um, um, who's, who's the, other, the other couple of lads, Lee, Lee Kilday, Lee Kilday. So that those boys kind of made a step up, and that's that's really gone back to um, Aki's kind of strategic plan with the club. So it was it was probably the right time for for the club to get rid of, or to get rid of me and to promote a couple of younger lads because they had Canzo, Marco, Simon Menson there to to educate these younger lads coming through. So again, the part of the club's philosophy is is, is to promote young kids. So it was the right time for, for the club anyway, but it was the right time for me and it was a different story. <laughs> uh, and you talked about how close-knit that, that side was with, with the management and the players. What was the conversation like? Did you have to have a conversation about, about, about leaving? What was the conversation like? Did they sit you down and let you know or was it just a... Yeah, no, I spoke, I spoke to Billy. It was one of those occasions where, you're, where everyone's sitting in the dressing room waiting for the, the curly finger, like one after another. So you're coming out with shake of the head or nod of the head, you know, this sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was one of those awkward moments. But I, I kind of knew I, I, the writing was on the wall for me a couple of games towards the end of the season when I wasn't in the squad. Um, so I knew it would, like, Billy was planting seeds um, for me to, 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 to let me know that basically I wasn't going to be there for the following season. So I, I'd come to terms with that anyway. But like, like I said, it was always realistic myself and, and honest enough with myself so I could see the right on the wall and it was, it was time for time for a new challenge and, and um, a new a change basically so yeah and you couldn't have asked really for a bigger change than, than going to Iceland um, yeah. I read I read in that that you said you wanted a move away from Scotland you kind of seek that new challenge so what was it about Iceland that stood out to be honest mate I'd always with international football international football for me was, was quite a different style of play and it was a slower game it was uh, more of a football base playing out from the back sort of stuff so um, yeah, I'd, I'd wanted I'd wanted to kind of better myself as a player and um, as a, as a footballer and passing and, and you know and, and and educating myself as well in a different style of style of football. So um, I looked at a couple of options. I actually ended up in Russia for for a couple of weeks on trial, and that was fucking mad. Like, it's crazy, <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was like Beirut over there, the, the club I went over to. But it was a great experience. Again. But they were often like stupid money. Like they were in the top flight in Russia, and they were often some like, like minimum was like seven grand a week and stuff like that. So. That was that was um if I'd have managed to get a move there, that would have been a that would have been a Carlsberg move, you know what I mean? So um but now I came back and I, I I'd actually looked at moves to Italy as well. I had me and Greece and, and and clubs like that. And then I actually went down to Wickham on trial um in England because my wife had got a job down in London. So we were kinda we were in between London and, and Hamilton. And um so she was down there and I went to try out Wickham and I, and I pulled my hamstring. I was marking Ryan Bertrand. I was playing Roy Fall for Wickham and he's run up and down the left wing and pulled my hamstring because I hadn't played in weeks. So I was a bit of, a bit of lack of condition there. My hamstrings weren't the best at the time anyway. So. <laughs> so I went down there, pulled my hamstring and then so that put me back six weeks and then I was kind of getting close to Christmas then on that stage. So I was like, right, look, I've got to be realistic here and say, look, January is going to be my me, me best move. So... I was doing a lot of work down myself. It was a, a going to see a running coach down in, in London, um, rehab and rehabilitation kind of coach and running coach. So I went to see him down there just to try and better myself and get rid of some of the injuries. And eventually the, the move to um, Iceland came up. So I ended up doing a pre-season camp with them um, in Portugal, in Albufeira. And they signed me the next week. So so I was, I was delighted with that move. And, and when I was over there, it's obviously... Um, 
not really it wouldn't be the biggest league in the world. It was really kind of community based, and um, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, my wife was still in London at the time, so it gave me a chance to really like immerse myself in the in the community and in and focus on myself. So I was going to the gym most days. I was arguably in the best condition of my career when I was over there because it was fully focused on, on playing football and um and and yeah, just preventing those injuries was, was the main thing for me at that time because I had a couple of seasons with Aki's where I was in and out because of injuries. And I really wanted to nail them and get to the bottom of them, and I felt over there like I kind of did. Um, so yeah, it was it was great. And one season over there, they 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 did offer me another two year deal, but myself and the wife just just decided it was it was time to come home and start a start a family and that. So without that support network and being a, over in Iceland as far away as it is, um, it was just the right time for me to come home. So when mm-hmm. I came back, it was uh, Trevor Crowley was my manager, um, and he was a fantastic football and coach and. Um, He's actually now he's he, since since moving from Sean Crowers, he's gone to Bohemians at uh, their rivals club and has been assistant there for the last couple of years. So he would have similar characteristics to, to Billy Reid, um, maybe better suited to assistant managers' roles. Um, he's a he's a really really good coach, probably one of the best coaches I worked under. Um, but well, um, maybe man management is his is his um, is his demise basically. But um. Yeah, look, I came back and played for Shamrock Rovers for a season um, and then bounced around for a couple of seasons because League of Ireland clubs and, and aren't really in a financial position to offer more than one-year contracts. So I found myself at Shamrock Rovers for a year and then I went up to Derry City for a year and then I ended up just kind of taking a step back and, and, and really assessing my whole career and where it's going and, and my family, the job I had in the background. And um, yeah, I decided to go part-time football and play up in Northern Ireland which is only an hour and a half drive up the road from us. And, and it was, like I said, part-time football. So it was Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So Tuesday, Thursday training with a game on a Saturday. And um, it, it ended up, I was getting similar money up north that I would at the League of Ireland Club if I was training five and six times a week. Mm-hmm. So I had to just reassess. And again, being being honest and, and realistic about my, my career and where it was going and um, refocused and family life was arguably are just more important at the time. So that's where I ended up. You mentioned at the start, obviously, congratulations on passing your degree in sports management. Um, Thank you very much. What's the next step for you? Um, are you thinking about maybe getting into sort of maybe a coaching role, management role, um, something a bit more in-depth than the game? Yeah, so the sport management degree, there, there's a perception of this, certainly in, in Ireland, and I think there's a course, a sport management course in Ireland that um, is is kind of coaching and um how would you say the the off the field stuff as well? So the commercial side, the course that I did was it was in from a day or in a Danish course and it was an online course and it was purely to do with the running of sports clubs and not necessarily football clubs at all. So there was no football sessions and no pitch sessions at all. It wasn't the the only or the only examples you'd use would be the the commercial um, frameworks and strategies of clubs and, and that sort of thing. So so realistically, I, I was working I was working completely in a completely different environment from the coaching aspect now on the flip side of that I have my A licence and I'm, I'm going to be doing my UEFA Elite U Day this year so I still have that um, on the other side of the, the kind of sporting um, side of side of my education you know um, so um, so yeah so so where, where where I see myself or where, where I kind of plan or where the, where the goal is maybe some, something along the lines of maybe like a sporting director's role, role. so you have that commercial um, expertise and you have the the, the coaching and the managing expertise as well now. Um, what I find now, so what happened over the last 18 months, I got the degree over the line just in January. And um, so I've been studying that for the last 18 months. But because of COVID, I haven't been I haven't been coaching or I had been coaching with, with Shelbourne FC and I'm now back doing a little bit with Shells. Um, but I've been full-time with them, training their under-17s and under-19s. And it's time-consuming. It was four days a week. Um, and then you could be on a bus on a Saturday or, or a Sunday across country could be three or four hours on the bus so and that was all voluntary work so I wasn't getting paid for any of that so so with COVID we ended up doing three pre-seasons with the lads that year so it was stop start stop start and it was an absolute nightmare so I just said you know what like so I had I actually had my, my diploma in business management for the first two years of this course and I had deferred um so I'd, I had five years deferred and um I re-registered in that September for that course um, but mainly because of COVID and mainly because of the the, the breaking in the season. And it was just, it was all over the place, really. And I was all over the place. And I can only imagine what the kids were like, mm-hmm. um, being, like doing a couple of pre-seasons. And then 
that's crucial time for their development as well. So they probably arguably missed out on, on a year, a full year playing against opposition their own age and developing themselves further. So really frustrating time. So I just I just decided it was the right time to go back and, and finish my degree and got thankfully got it over the line in January. So um yeah, so I put myself in a position where I, where I have an A license um you wait for your A license badge um on the coaching pitch and the manager side of things. Um I've also got a, a commercial now qualification in the business management or the sport management of a football club and, uh, and everything to do with the background. Um, on the course, I was doing an internship at Shells as well. I was lucky enough to, to know the chairman or the CEO and he, he let me go in and, and do my internship there. So I have a bit of experience in, in what the club and what Shelburne have been working on um, in the background. And yeah, I just like maybe maybe a sporting director's role just because I have the, the, my experience with my playing career and, and the coaching now at this stage. So um. The only the only problem we have now is that in the last eighteen months, because I've I've stepped away from football, I've been able to focus more on work, mm-hmm. and I've got a couple of promotions in work. So now I'm at a, at a level now financially where um, I'm, I'm well paid. So if the football comes back for me, they're going to have to pay for me. So it's it's a it's a, it's a luxury position to be in, but but it's um it's a it's a choice I can make if 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 I really want to go back into the football, you know. And right. before we before we touch on Aki's sort of that season. <clears throat> There's, um, there's a few players that we wanted to ask you about, just if you get any stories of them, just <laughs> you know, what opinion of them. So, um, the this first... is where I'm going to play, play the fifth and say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Davey Dave Winters was the first one. Yeah, uh, Wendy's a great character. Wendy's was, he was such a bubbly character in the dressing room and he was always one to stay out after training, practicing shooting or finishing or crossing or whatever it is, whatever position he found himself in. Um, he was like he was just like a kid the whole time. He just he just wanted to have a football at his feet the whole time. Um, and I think he was one of one of the lads who was unlucky not to not to be kept on when we went to, to the SPL, um, because he had such high quality, especially in that first division. He scored a lot of important goals for us that season, and um, really good player, really good character. And um, yeah, the the nights out, I won't mention the nights out, <laughs> but uh, no, great lad. I think he's a great lad. And. Briefly mentioned them, so McCarthy and MacArthur, um, obviously you were young when you came in, um, similar to them, they were making their breakthrough. Um, could you always tell they were going to make it right to the very top? Um, certainly James McCarthy, yes, because of the, the impact he had at 16 and 17 when he burst onto the scene, basically. Um, James McCarthy, James is one of these guys where you'd have to kill him um, to beat him, if you know what I mean. So um, probably... Like he, he'll be honest to this as well, James. He'll tell you that he wasn't as probably talented as naturally talented as James McCarthy was. But mm-hmm. um, James was willing to go the extra mile and do the extra work. And and, and if, like I talked about Winty's being out there after training and doing like ball skills, and uh, James McCarthy was out there with him. So it was the two of them most of the time. Like two kids. Like James is the same. He's a <laughs> he's a gas lad. It was only a couple of years ago we were we were away with, with him himself and, and Big Marco for for Marco Stagdale. Um, so yeah, we got to we got to relive a couple of stories and, and uh, have a few more sessions with them, but uh, nothing nothing changes. And, and that's the that was the great thing about that group of, of Aki's lads. Like we could we could all, we could all go out tomorrow night, and it would just be like old times, and, and nothing would change. You know, I think someone you played with um, for a couple of seasons um, was Martin Cannon. Yeah, um, how was Martin? Could you t- did you think he was ever going to get any management? And like, what was your sort of relationship with him? Um. Again, Kanzo was, was was a leader. He was, he was one of the main characters in our group and he was one of the guys that when we signed, although he was a centre-half and probably kept me out of the team um, quite often, um, he was a, he was a great character and integrated really well with the squad. Um, he was Alex's best mate anyway. So we knew of Kanzo anyway. We obviously played against him for years and knew, knew he was a great player. Um, in terms of if if I thought he was going to go into management, it was it was one of them. I don't think Kanzo was... was Kanzo was sure he was going to go into management at the time either. So when I left, I don't, I don't know even if he had his B license at the time. Um, but certainly after I left, I think Alex got the job soon after. And I think Kanzo then went, right, OK, yeah, this is what I want to do. And he started focusing on his badges then. And, and as soon as you get the, get that kind of hunger for it or the, or the desire for coaching, it's, it's, uh, or the bug, if you like, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to lose. So, yeah. So uh, I thought Kanzo had done, done a decent job as, as Aki's manager um, for the couple of years he was there. Um, it was disappointing the way I finished in the end. I think it got kind of personal, nearly. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah. But Kanzo, Kanzo was a great player and, and he was a good manager for Aki. So goes down as a club legend as well. I think. 
And then to follow on the sort of line we're talking about man- uh, people going into management, Dougie Emery as well. He's um, started his started his management career flying. Um, what was Dougie like in the dressing room? I know I've heard a few stories about him being a bit of character. And I'm sure we, we've all seen it with the sort of derby games and whatnot. Um, what was Dougie like in the dressing room? Dougie was great to have in the dressing room. He was, he was, he was hilarious. Like, um, wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't have been the brightest spark in the dressing room, so you'd always get a bit of crack out of him in there. <laughs> So, yeah, so i surprised Dougie's gone into football management, but then, on the other hand, I'm not, because football has been Dougie's life. So he lives and breathes football. So um, And then in the in the latter stages of his, of his career, he became more mature and stopped doing the silly little things, and he was made captain and stuff like that. So, so yeah, there was a, there was he developed into a leader where he would have been a bit of a jack the lad in our, in our changing room at the time. Um, sometimes giving it the, giving it the, the, the big one, giving it the, the Charlie, Charlie statements and all that sort of stuff, but... That was all part of our dressing room because as soon as he mentioned it, it was about five of us jumping on him trying to punch the head off him. So it was gas. <laughs> and then it got into Aki's this season. Another one which you obviously spent the dressing room with was Stuart Taylor, who is now um now our manager um this season. Um he started his management career in Ireland with Limerick. Um did you could you tell Stuart was going to be a manager? And what was your sort of thoughts when you did hear that he was becoming Aki's manager? Um, yeah, I think it was a natural progression for Stan. Um, for, first of all, I know Stan pretty well. I know him on a personal level and still contact him. Um, to this day, he was, was trying to get him a couple of players over to you guys. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, so look, at um, I think Stan's natural progression was when he finished up playing, he went in, in as a assistant manager. And he put on most of the sessions and Billy would oversee um, the, the sessions, the day-to-day kind of operations of the, of the, the squad and the team. Um, but stand sessions were always enjoyable, always good, always high intensity, um, always demanded the best, the best out of you. So I guess, um, yeah, as it was again like a natural progression. He stepped into the coaching role fairly seamlessly. So for him to step into the management role is it was a definite. And I mean, I, I, I spent time in over here with Limerick FC as well. And um, when he was over here, played against his teams, and um, yeah, like just I've, I've always kind of kept in touch with Stan, and and he he's he's had a, a great kind of. Um, Experience since since stepping away from from Limerick and that and, and being um, Paul Lambert's assistant for years at, at a couple of clubs down in England and that's that's that stands him in great stead and he, he can learn from learn from them and all those experiences and and hopefully make a success out of Zaki's career. You said um, you um, tried to give him a few players with any of them strikers. Yeah, a couple. Yeah, we need a striker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was a couple. There was a couple of strikers on that list. Um, the, the only issue is like that that um, you're seeing a little bubble coming back into the Irish football here now, where there's a lot, there's a, a few players on good money. So um, it may be a case of that these these guys are now being priced out of Aki's uh, out of Aki's budget. Um, now a striker in particular that I mentioned would have been Georgie Kelly, who would have been on on everybody's shortlist. He, he scored twenty odd goals last year for Bohemians. Um, wouldn't have been on that much money at balls. We'll be talking four or five hundred euro a week. Um, he's now signing for Rotherham. Now Rotherham and League One are a big club. They wouldn't have offered him less than a couple of grand a week, I'd imagine. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that fits into Aki's budget or it certainly. Stan, Stan, I know he had a couple of conversations with him, but couldn't convince him to go across. But um, yeah, that's just that's just the way it is. I'm afraid. Um, I think I think everybody's after a striker anyway, Andy. <laughs> yeah, we desperately need one. Uh, one of the players we did sign, though, that got your seal of approval uh, was Daniel O'Reilly. Scored his yeah. first goal uh, for the club at the weekend. So, um, what did you know? Of, what did you know of, of Daniel before, and um, why did you think he would be such a good fit? Yeah, so I've been working with Shells and the underage teams, um, and I, I know Shells' first team manager or Shells' ex first team manager Ian Morris really well. Um, stood in a couple of sessions just to give them a dig out at the first team level, and Dan O'Reilly was signed. Um, in his he was only there for one season. We would have signed in our pre-season and during the pre-season I would have been um, watching games and watching training and and uh, yeah like definitely approved of his of his ability and his signing at Shells anyway. Um, uh, he's he's one of these players that likes defending. Um, he really really likes getting close to people and putting tackles in and, and the physical side of the game. Um, he's he's um, athletic. He's he can he can run. He can jump. He's he's qu- quite quick. Um, and he can score a goal as well, which is which is all, all, all good. And he and he can play a bit of football as well when, when he when he wants to when he needs to. Um, so all around, I think his game suits Aki's and, and their style of play and their, their philosophy. And uh, yeah, it was a good time. Like, I didn't know about the move until it actually happened, mm-hmm. but I would have definitely recommend recommend him to for, to Stanley. 
Um, obviously, more about Aki's this season. We've we've obviously got relegated last season after seven years in the top flight, and we're not doing particularly the best this season. Um, you obviously mentioned about the mixture of experience and youth, and how that was extremely important for how well you done in the sort of harmony within the dressing room. This past couple of years, we've probably seen that it's more majority just youth, yeah. and not not so much experience, which we go on about constantly that we do need that mixture and you've obviously made it more evident that it is extremely important. Do you think that's maybe where what's maybe seen us get relegated and perhaps not at a certain level that we were used to because the mixture isn't there? Um, yeah, I think it's a good point. I think there has to be a good balance in the squad. Um, now, what, what you get with young players in particular, you get you get inconsistency. You get, the, you, like, like I mentioned before, like um, so say my fourth season with Aki's when we finished fourth, fourth, there was a lot of inexperienced young lads coming through there. And quite possibly that's the reason why we didn't push for the league that year. Because, it, like I said, you get inconsistencies with young players. They're, they're not as consistent and they're not as as um, long in the tooth as the, as the older pros. Um, some games, you just need to get yourself through. If you're having a bit of a mare, young lads don't really understand this. And they could be running around trying. So, sometimes there's a phrase where some lads are trying too hard. You know, um, uh, That can be a case for a lot of young players, especially... Working with young lads um, over the last couple of years, you, you see that like you know, day in day out, like and their, and their heads go down when they make mistakes and stuff like that. So it's all about like building that resilience in young players and 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 um, then getting the experience at senior level as well. Um, but the balance is is, is crucial. And, and look at assessing the accuracy from the outside in. I'd, I'd say that is a is um is definitely a factor why is is it kind of first of all gotten relegated. But when Stan took over, I, I felt from the outside looking in that the club was a bit all over the place. And when Stan took in, it was a it was a little bit late in the day. I think they could have done something a little bit quicker to appoint Stan and let him build the squad quicker and, and get the players that he wanted in. Now, on top of that, you have players. When Stan comes in, you have players that are there on contracts already from the previous manager. So it's going to take a couple of transfer windows in a couple of years for Stan to really put his stamp on on the team and on, on the club. And and um, like I've, I've no doubt that he'll, that he'll do that anyway. Our next game obviously is against Doug Emery's Morton that are high flying. Something we ask all our guests uh, to do is to give a score prediction. Uh, for the following game, we've got a bit of a league table with the fans and whoever's top of the table wins a wins a prize at the end of the season. So, if you were to give a score prediction for Aki's versus Morton at the weekend, what would you say? Is the home away? Uh, it's okay. um, but it's not. Um, it's nowhere near the fortress it used to be when you were there. No, no, yeah. I, look, <laughs> look at you guys are probably better. You guys are probably better suited as underdogs going into games now, as we always were. Um, uh, to be honest, for a prediction for the game, Morton are flying. Dougie's done really well since he went in there. Um, so if I was Aki's at the minute, I know it's it's a home game, but um, just don't lose. So I go for a one-all draw. Fair enough. Um, and what we also do um, with all our sort of former players is we have a sort of segment at the end where we ask sort of fans questions. We have a sort of teammate question and whatnot. So um, before we do that, um, yeah, if you've got any other players that you can recommend, please continue to do so. <laughs> We definitely need a striker, so please yeah, keep pushing the striker. I have a short list for Stan, I send them every week. Right. Um, okay, so teammates, um, so what we've got is, first of all, longest in the shower. Longest in the shower. There's a few of them, to be fair, it was quite a long dress now, Molly. We go for a big marker. Uh, best trainer and worst trainer. You could probably throw James McCarthy into both categories, because some days he was brilliant and some days he was awful. Best trainer would probably James McCarthy. Uh, even even at 15 he burst onto the training pitch and was like Jesus what this fella's unreal <laughs> um, worst trainer I remember there was, a, there was a stage actually where we'd done the yellow jersey and every Friday so worst trainer has to wear the wear the, the yellow bib and all the writing all over it uh, for the rest of the for the rest of the week uh, do, you know, no, do you know who was worst trainer it's, got, it's very harsh here because he's a great lad as well Brian Wake no oh, Wakey Thank you, Wakey <laughs> <laughs> oh stop I think you got the yellow jersey every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, fastest player at the club? Probably David Graham. David Graham is quite... Oh, no, sorry. Richard Offion. Jesus. Yeah. I forgot about Rich there. Uh, funniest at your time? Funniest character. Probably Wendy's, I'd say. He'd be up there as a character. Um, and then, like, not not even trying to be funny. Dougie would have been funny just with some of the, the shit he used to come out with. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah. No, there's a few characters, anyway. A few characters in, in, over the years. Worst dress sense? Uh, Alex Neal. <laughs> a few people have said that. So. Yeah, um, uh, it's just, it's just annoying because it was it's just basic. You never tried, never tried to do anything. So, 
<laughs> if they describe each of these players slash um, Aki's related people within one word, uh, Big Marco. Legend. David Winters. Leonetic. Simon Menson. Gent. Scottish Judders. Oh, see these. <laughs> that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard Offio. Um, what do you say? What do you say with the big man? Um, probably the, the the most talented player I played with on his day. The Pat Shaw twins. Oh wow! Well. <laughs> <laughs> they were they were supermodels. Um. Tony Stevenson. Oh, I used to, my nickname for Tony was Zizu, so we'll just say that Zizu. And Brian Carrigan. Oh, Rocket. <laughs> 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 um, and then we've just got a few fans' questions as well. So people have asked them: um, Is there any funny incidents or moments that won't be of public knowledge that you can mention throughout your time? Yeah, there's a few belters in there, and, and I'm one of these people that, that can't hold in any laughter if anything like this happens. So one I was actually caught in Sky Sports, um, in the third eye, when when Billy turned around in, in, in a rage or somebody missing a chance and went to hit the top of the dugout and completely fell and decked it. In, against Mother? Like, yeah, yep. completely fell, decked it, fell over the seat and everything, and I'm absolutely in stitches. Um, <laughs> uh, and absolute ribbons. Like, I couldn't hold in the laugh, and there's the camera pointing right at me, Sky Sports, and I was like, Jesus Christ, I'm never going to play again for this man. <laughs> <laughs> but there was, another, there was one other incident as well where our strength conditioning coach, uh, Ross, Ross Hughes, Higgy, um, him and the gaffer had a race around the pitch one of days. Because uh, the gaffer, gaffer obviously being fit and a hard worker as a player, um, he still fancied his, fancies his chances of beating Higgy in a race. Because Hig- <laughs> the gaffer used to say, "We Higgy, the fat guy, he won't be able to beat me in a race." <laughs> so we used to have some crack. So I think after on a Friday session, one of the, one of the Fridays, so both of them started on the halfway line on one side of the pitch and ran in opposite directions and had a race. <laughs> and and the gaffer Billy Reid pulled his calf halfway around and his <laughs> halfway around. <laughs> Uh, so there, was a, there was a few moments like that and stories like that it was just brilliant like so, some of the com- camaraderie with that group and especially the things that Billy used to have us doing and all, it was so funny like, so it was, it was a good crack and a great a great squad and a great dressing room to play for hmm. What was your best moment at Aki's? Um, ah, has to be the promotion I mean just just the, the sense of relief and and um, oh, just just yeah, just a relief and, and the, the the joy after that final whistle went that Clyde. I mean, it, it was like Billy was crying his eyes out, and uh, like I, I mean, all of us were fairly close to it. Only for we were all ecstatic with, with excitement. We probably would have been in the same in the same um, the same emotional state as Billy. Uh, but we were just I think we were, we were, we were most of us were quite young and we were focusing on the party and we we're going to be doing that over the next couple of days. <laughs> Uh, Stuart Cold- Caldwell, one of the fans, has asked, um, who was your toughest opponent in the Championship and toughest opponent in the Premiership? Yeah, um, both both players would probably have similar similar characteristics. So in the first division, I'd say Graham Dorans, uh, just because of his pace. Um, obviously, me not being uh, the most athletic of centre-halves and the most quickest centre-halves, just used to, used to enjoy our, a little bit less marking against a striker who had a bit of pace. Um, and then in the top flight, it would have been Kenny Miller then, just sharpness and and uh, pace in behind and, and uh, in around the box it was hard to hard to live with for a lad my size so yeah probably those two and Callum Wilson is asked um, from that um, promotion uh, promotion winning team is there any players that you felt were underrated maybe didn't get the recognition that they deserved um, from the promotional team is that what he said yeah 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 I'm trying to think of the group that was there um I don't know if, if there was if there was I think there was a couple of like myself for example I probably would have been one of the, the underrated players of the squad but I think that's as a defender you, you kind of accept that mm-hmm. um, I think everybody else there was there was such um, hype over the likes of James McCarthy James McCarthy that uh, even the likes of Alex Neal w- wouldn't have got the as much limelight as he as he probably should have you know uh, being our captain and big Marco as well like you know so um, we were quite happy to to let the lads take the limelight and um, and us get on with the job so. Yeah, no, I'd probably, yeah, there would have been a few, like, apart, like, apart from um, the obvious, um, 
exceptions like, like James McCarthy, James McCarthy, Easty, and that. So you're probably talking about somebody, somebody like Tom Parrott was was excellent. Um, probably w- wouldn't be re- remembered as much as as the rest of us maybe. Um, but for for those couple of seasons, he was he was really consistent, really good, and um, he was a great lad in the dressing room as well. Like so, so yeah, maybe maybe Tom Parrott just because he's my mate as well. <laughs> Stuart, Stuart Latimer has asked, was it was it deliberate that you were always the last one to clap off the fans? Um. Ah. I don't know if it was deliberate, but I, I, I wanted to make a conscious effort that, that I appreciate the fans and, and we appreciate the fans. So I think I think that squad of Aki's players and we're always out there clapping the fans and, and it, it was there was definitely appreciation. But it was a good connect, a uh, good connection between that group and the fans. Um you guys have seen us been successful for say for the first time in twenty years and get up to, into the SPL. So the, the, I don't want to say you guys loved us, but there was there was a mutual kind of respect and, and admiration for, for both parties, I think. And then last but not least, um, John Busby has asked, did you ever have a sleepover at Scott Strillers guy? Absolutely not, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, well, David, that brings us to the end of it. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. No problem at all. Absolutely. Thanks so much, David. Thank you very much. Man. Appreciate it. Cheers.